All right, we're gonna get started today. Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We are really excited to host our very first official webinar as One Valley, formerly GSV Labs. Um, and today we have a great uh, program provided to us by Digital Ocean, our Perks partner. Um, before we get started, I did just wanna remind anyone who was unfamiliar about Passport, um, our product here at One Valley, that is the world's most comprehensive digital innovation platform, uh, connecting entrepreneurs, emerging startups to access to vital resources, networks, and significant savings on essential businesses. We have over 25,000 members in our network um, over 140 mentors, 450 investors, and over a million dollars in discounts on, on services that startups often need to grow. So if you are not already a Passport member, we'd love to have you check it out. Um, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mason, who's going to be running the show today. Um, you know, just a, a few couple of notes. Please feel free, throw your any questions you have in the chat. Mason and I will both be checking that out and, and we'll be making sure that he can get to those questions as needed. Um, so with that, Mason, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, let me pull every, make sure I've got everything in the right place real quick. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. There we go. Awesome. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, hello and welcome to uh, this uh, webinar Tech Talk today. Really excited to have everyone here. Um, come on, PowerPoint, there we go. Uh, my name is Mason Egger and I'm a developer advocate at DigitalOcean. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Mason Egger if you have any questions. Uh, that you would like to ask me uh, either today or at other times. I'm, I'm pretty uh, receptive to uh, questions and all that. Um, before I was a developer advocate at DigitalOcean, I actually worked as a site reliability engineer for Expedia Group, specifically the Verbo brand of Expedia Group. And um, we've built a lot of cloud infrastructures and stuff. So today I'm going to kind of share with you uh, some of my experience uh, with that. And also we're going to build a minimum uh, production ready infrastructure on DigitalOcean using Terraform today and kind of go over that. So today we're basically just gonna do a quick high level overview of what we're going to be building, which will be uh, uh, just a very, what I, what I would consider a very straightforward and very typical um, cloud architecture for most uh, businesses and companies. Um, this is most, cloud architectures at some point in, in the company's life cycle will look something similar to this. You may add stuff later. Uh, it's very likely that you will add, but there's usually this kind of architecture. Um, we're gonna talk about which DigitalOcean products we're gonna be using. This is actually a really fun presentation for me to give because I actually get to touch on a lot of different uh, products and offerings that DigitalOcean has to offer. Um, but this architecture, luckily, it, it, it will ex it will extend beyond DigitalOcean. These are not these are not products that DigitalOcean has that are that are only offered by DigitalOcean. These are very broad topics: compute, uh, networking uh, concepts, databases, things like that. We're going I'm going to be uh, live coding this using Terraform, so that's always fun doing a live coded uh, webinar, and hopefully uh, everything goes well with that. Sometimes live coding stuff. Uh, Anyone who's ever done a live coded presentation before, you know it, it can be, it, it's it's kind of a coin flip. Um, we're gonna use create Terra, we're gonna create some Terraform files to create our infrastructure. Um, if you'd like to follow along with this, uh, with this webinar, or if you just wanna see all of the code in its, com in its completeness, um, if you go to do.co slash tf dash sample dash arcs, um, I have, we already have all of this uploaded, uh, ready to go. There we go. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all uploaded there. I'm going to kind of walk through a lot of that. So you can always follow along from there. And the architecture of what we're going to be building today is a very simple, uh, load balanced web, web stack. So it's a minimal architecture for a LEP star stack. So, um, and this, so in the, there used to be what was called a lamp stack. Like I remember being, it, it still exists. It's still around. I remember it being big and popular when I was in uh, university, but Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP. Now uh, we kind of remove the acronyms and use them for 
whatever on earth you want to use. So today we're going to be working with Linux and then we're going to be using Nginx because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a web server framework that I enjoy using a little bit more, a little bit more minimal, a little bit easier to use. Uh, Postgres, we're going to use a, we're going to do Postgres database instead of PHP. And then the star here basically stands for whatever you want to be. Um, I'm actually not going to be focusing on any of the web technologies today. I'm more focused on getting the infrastructure laid up, laid out. So that way uh, you are ready to, deploy your code uh, however you like. So it could be a PHP stack. It could be Python. It could be uh, Rails. So that, that last that last letter there, it could be whatever you would like. Um, we're just going to get it set up for static uh, infrastructure today. Um, so basically, this is going to be a redundant web cluster that can access a database. All of our traffic will ingress through a load balancer with SSL termination. So essentially, this means that HTTPS traffic will come in to our uh, cluster and then it will be decrypted at the load balancer level using SSL termination and then forwarded to uh, your web servers. This is this can be really uh, valuable because you would hope that within inside of your VPC, within inside of the boundary that all the traffic is secure. Um, so by decrypting it at the load balancer level, you're taking some of the burden and some of the load off of the web servers because uh, encryption and decryption are very expensive computationally. Um, it takes a lot of cycles inside of the CPU to perform these operations. So by allowing the load balancer to do it, which the load balancer is managed by DigitalOcean, um, you are not having to worry about, say, having a larger, uh, larger server to handle the encryption issues or having to worry about any of that. You're just, we're basically uh, leveraging that off against the cloud provider. Um, we're going to allow SSH access through what's called as a bastion server. Um, they're also known as jump boxes or jump ins, or there's a lot of different things. And essentially what we're going to do is to ensure the security of our web servers, we're actually not going to have them facing the public internet whatsoever. Um, there's only going to be two ways into this isolated environment, and that's via the HTTPS or HTTP protocol uh, through the load balancer and then through the SSH protocol into the bastion. We'll have no other access to the web servers other than that, and we'll I'll show how to do this with the uh, with the Bastion host. So the products that we're going to use is uh, we're going to use DigitalOcean's virtual private clouds. Again, these are what I would consider kind of cloud primitives. They're not uh, exclusive to DigitalOcean. There's a lot of different. Um, every, pretty much every cloud provider has some semblance of a virtual private cloud. So essentially, this creates kind of what I would call a virtual a virtual data center. So it allows us to create isolated network segments where we can put servers and such inside of them and then communicate across private IPs. And then through the setting up of firewall rules and such, we can be sure that no one outside of this, uh, inside of this segmented uh, network space will be able to access them. So they're very, very uh, valuable. It's a relatively new feature with DigitalOcean. Um, I think we released this sometime this year. I think earlier this year, if I remember correctly. Um, I was really excited for that. I think I wrote this entire talk just to talk about VPCs. Uh, so then we're gonna be talking about droplets, which droplet is basically just a way of saying, um, I guess, expandable compute or scalable compute. So our web servers are gonna be Linux servers, probably gonna use Ubuntu 2004. So compute resources, we're gonna use DNS. So that way people can actually access our services through a very typical, you know, www.myservice.com. Most people don't use IP addresses when they try to uh, go to specific websites. So DNS is really valuable here. We're gonna use firewalls to protect our, uh, protect our droplets, protect our databases. Basically, this is how we're going to create the, like this paired with VPCs is how we create the ingress and egress rules for network data inside of our network segmentation. We're going to use load balancers to load balance the request across, a, off our, across our web servers to make sure that as data comes in, as, as someone tries to access our website, if one of these servers were to go down, they would still be served. And this is, this is pretty typical. Um, you, know, you can start off with one server, but then you have a single point of failure and it makes it a little bit more difficult uh, rolling forward to deal with that. So um, like if you would make an update or something and you, you push a new change to the code and it breaks well now the whole service is down whereas if you do it load balanced across a handful of servers you can update one at a time and then hopefully if one of them breaks yes it's broken but the load balancer will detect that no traffic should be sent to the service um, and there'll be you know essentially no downtime there which is a very valuable tool for us and the last thing we're going to talk about is managed databases um, you can purchase managed databases from your cloud provider 
or you could always spin up a droplet and maintain your own. It really depends. Um, there are both advantages and disadvantages to both. Maintaining databases is not necessarily something that, uh, like if you're not an expert in maintaining databases, it might not be something that you're interested in. So going with managed databases might be the better option. But if you're someone who like, knows databases and does performance tuning and knows all of that kind of, uh, those kind of things, um, I'll happily admit, I am not very much of a database person. So, uh, but I've heard from people who say, you know, they need to be able to tune very specific parameters. Your managed database may not, you know, expose this. So then at that point, you might just need to spin up a large piece of compute um, and work with the database. But for this purpose, since you know it's gonna be a very simple app, we're just gonna go ahead and go with the database. And that's pretty much what we're gonna build. I'm gonna be bouncing back and forth between, um, we're gonna go back to this page and keep this page open. And I'm gonna go back and forth as I build these things in Terraform and kind of demo it and go from there. So if we go ahead and close that out and we go over here to my VS code, we'll see that I have a blank main.tf file. Actually, first, before we do this, so Terraform, let's just talk about Terraform real quick before I get into this, because I don't want to assume that everyone knows what Terraform is. So Terraform is a great tool by HashiCorp uh, that I've been using in my, pretty much my entire career. Um, it's, it's, a, it's basically a tool that creates infrastructure as code. So I will be able to define my infrastructure through Terraform specific um, language. It's called HCL, HashiCorp Configuration Language. And with this, and then since these are uh, these are paired up with providers, so essentially DigitalOcean or other providers will create what's known as a provider, and then they will tell you how to access these services and or how to create these services. We will write them according to the uh, according to the specification. We will run a couple, like one command, one or two commands, and it will stand up all of our infrastructure for us. Then we will modify our infrastructure and go and you know we can change it go from there that's it's really good to have uh to use a tool like terraform or pulumi or some sort of infrastructure as code tool because you you will see infrastructure drift the longer the longer your infrastructure is up the longer you are in business performing actions you will see your infrastructure start to drift back and forth between you know like oh i had to make this one-off change on this server i did it and you know now that server is fine it's fixed we did it to all of them but we didn't write it down and then when you go to expand to spin up new servers, maybe, you know, someone forgot to write it down. Someone forgot to make these changes. And then you're back basically at square one trying to figure out what needs to be fixed. So with Terraform, since I can def define all of my infrastructure as code and then run a command to run it, I'm, you know, I know that the code will be up to date, that I will be able to deploy the same infrastructure anywhere. Um, it also allows me, since we can put all of this in GitHub, it now allows me to version my infrastructure, which is really nice because then I can, if I ever need to know like, hey, what operating system was I running, you know, two years ago, what, you know, what, what packages were installed, what kind of, what kind of things did we have going on that back then, I can actually go and see those versions, excuse me, and go from there. So we start off with main.tf and I'm going to go ahead and pull up the Terraform provider docs. Provider DigitalOcean. So the Terraform provider docs will, I'll reference back and forth to these, but this is really how you kind of um, learn how to do stuff. So whenever we want to do a resource, we're gonna come over here to DigitalOcean droplet and it will show us, this is how we will create a droplet. Um, the DigitalOcean provider tells us from the, from the beginning how to use the provider. So we're going to go ahead and say provider. Let me pull up my, yes. So the first thing we do in main, provider, DigitalOcean. And we'll basically need to say our token equals, and then this is where we actually need to have a token available to us. and. You don't really want to hard code your token in directly into this environment. You want to, because if you just put like my token and it's actually your token and you commit this to GitHub, now you've leaked credentials and you have to be very careful about that. You cannot leak your credentials. Um, bad things happen when people, other people have your API keys. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do var.do underscore token. And that's gonna lead us over here to creating our next file, variables.tf. And then if I go, 
And then what I would do here is I do variable do token curly brackets. And so we save that and we save this. And now we, we have the beginning of a Terraform uh, file. So there's, these are what I, what I would consider two of the main files. There's two other files that I typically uh, create whenever I start working with Terraform. I create a data.terraform file, which essentially allows me to use what are known as data sources. Um, data sources are part of Terraform's uh, settings and it's, it's kind of part, part of Terraform's, uh, one of the things they provide where I can get read-only data from the API and I like providing them in a single place. So that way uh, it's really easy to know where they're at and everybody can find them. And it's really easy to change them, excuse me. And then the other thing we're gonna do is create outputs.tf, outputs.tf. And this file will essentially allow us to output certain information as we get it from our Terraform provider. So what I need to do now is I need to get an API token from DigitalOcean, which I'm gonna do really quick. I'm gonna go ahead and generate a new token and we're just gonna call this GSV Labs. And I'm gonna generate this off screen so people can't see my token, ha ha ha. Um, even though I will delete it right after the fact. And then one of the things that you can use when in Terraform that's really nice, export uh, TF var DO token. And what I can do with this is because I can set this as an environment variable. And with TF var, it basically tells me that this is a Terraform variable. And then whatever the name of my variable is inside of my variables file, I put it in all caps. And then the Terraform uh, provider will parse this for me and pull this out. So I'm gonna come over here, come here. We're gonna go ahead and save this root, paste in my Terraform provider token. And we have that. So we're inside of our main uh, folder, that directory that has all of our Terraform files. And we're gonna go ahead and run a Terraform in it. Okay, um, this is something I did not provide a Terraform, uh, a Terraf uh, basically a provider file. Uh, within the most recent versions of 0 0.12 to 0 0.13, Terraform has um, changed how they bring in providers, which is totally fine. And even if you uh, if you know you didn't get right, you can always just run this command. I have not gotten into the habit. Come on, where is it at? Where did it go? We're just gonna copy this. Paste this, yes. So this basically will create this ver uh, versions.tf file, which now tells us which version of the DigitalOcean Terraform provider to use. So now we can run a Terraform. I think that does, now. yeah, now we can run our Terraform in it. It installs our Terraform provider. And now this, uh, this directory is now set up to be a Terraform, uh, basically a Terraform directory. So now we can run things like Terraform plan and there's no changes to be made. We didn't make any changes. We didn't really do anything. Um, this will basically take all of our code and see what the change, what's currently out there, what it wants to do and what the difference will be between the two and tries to make a plan of that and let you know, since we haven't done anything yet, it's not gonna do anything. So that's basically the setups of Terraform. I would say that the, you know these, these five files, I have to get used to adding a versions.tf. Um, <laughs> haven't, gotten, haven't gotten there yet. Been using Terraform for a while. That's kind of new to me, so. Uh, let's go ahead and build our infrastructure. So to build the infrastructure out from here, what we want to do is we want, I, I have, there's there's a couple of different methodologies for creating cloud infrastructure. Um, some people like to work from the inside out and kind of like expand and build, or some people work from the outside in. Um, my personal opinion is anytime that I'm dealing with any sort of networking parts, uh, like, a, like a VPC, I want to work from the outside in. I want to always have my droplets or my compute inside of these, um, inside of this VPC at all times. I don't want to create it, uh, create a droplet and then add a VPC and try to add the droplet to the VPC. This could lead to the destruct, des destroying and recreating of the droplet. Um, Terraform, basically Terraform only is only as good as the API. So the API that runs it and by like, so DigitalOcean's API, another cloud provider's API. So if it doesn't work out, it's very often that they, Terraform will just destroy a resource and bring up a new one. It's easier for Terraform in that, in that sense. It's, it's how the API was written. So if I create droplets and then try to add them to VPC, it's potentially that I could be deleting droplets. And then if I'm already running something that could lead to an outage, we don't really like outages, outages are scary. 
So what we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and create a really quick uh, just network file right here. And we're going to create our VPC. So I call this network.tf. And typically if I'm doing anything with a lot of networking stuff, I will create like different, but I guess different files for different components of it. So what I would go ahead and say now is we're going to go here and say resource digital ocean. Also, if this text is too small, please let me know. VPC, and then we're going to give it a name. So the way that Terraform providers work is resource is kind of like the, the it just says, this is the type we're making. There's a resource and there's a data source. We're going to make a DigitalOcean VPC, and this is the variable name that we're going to be, um, you know, referencing it at. And actually, I am going to make the text a little bit bigger because I just want to font. Yeah, we're going to make it 18. That should be, yeah, that's a little bit better. So, and then what we would do here is like whenever you start working with these Terraform parts, you're gonna, you, it's, you can come back and forth to the Terraform registry and you would say DigitalOcean, come on, VPC. And this will tell you how to create one, the resource assignments, what the argument reference are, what attributes it's going to, it can return that you'll be able to access. Um, so from here, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to keep coming back and forth to this just because it'll take a little bit of time. But I, like, as you see me working on these resources, I've, I've basically looked all this up in the Terraform reference and then went from there. So we're going to go ahead and create, we're going to give it a name. Name is one of the things we have to do. So we're just going to call it equals, we're going to call it GSV labs. It will be the name of our, our um, thing and then region. Now we could just say like SFO three, so this stands for San Francisco 3. That's one of the data centers that DigitalOcean provides. But if I want to change this, now I actually have to modify the code to change it instead of using our variables file, which is actually what our variables file is for. So let's go ahead and say var.region and we'll go create a variable there in a second. And then we're going to create an IP range. Um, if you, you, you don't have to do this, you like DigitalOcean will provide you an IP range. Um, but I like to tend, tend to like to do this and create my own just to make sure there's nothing conflicting. And basically what this is gonna do is it's gonna create a small little subnet uh, or a small little virtual private cloud where there's IP addresses and it's gonna be within the subnet of the uh, 168.64/24. So it's the smallest we can make on DigitalOcean. And that basically means that we'll have roughly 250 IP addresses if we needed them. So now we've created this and this is where the fun part comes in. Now I can do a Terraform plan. I did not declare the variable file. That's what I forgot to do. So what we'll do now is we'll come over here and we will create a variable. I will add the variable for region. So what we're gonna do next is say variable region. And then we could just leave it blank like we did with DO token, but we're actually gonna make this a little bit more prescriptive. We're gonna say this type has to be a string. So we are gonna validate the type on it. And, um, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and go with a uh, a default region. So I don't I can set a default value for my for my variables. Now with it with the token, it doesn't really make sense for me to set a default variable. I can't set a default access token, but I can with this. So I can just say SFO three. And if I set this to the default, then if it's if I don't provide this anywhere else, um, either as a command line variable as a or as a uh, environment variable, it will just take my default variable. So now this network file will, should just work because now it's just gonna say var.region. It's gonna come over here to our variables, see that we're what we want to deploy in SFO3 and go ahead and go it. So now let's try doing a Terraform plan. Yes, and as you can see now Terraform has told us, hey, we're going to create some resources. So I'm gonna to create a VPC for you uh, inside of San Francisco. It's gonna be the name this, this will be the IP range. So let's go ahead and do a Terraform apply on this. Um, I didn't, as you say in the note, it says that I didn't save an out. Um, you can save these plans and then execute that plan from a file or I tend to just do a Terraform apply. It shows me the plan again. It asks me if I'm sure that I wanna create one, I say yes. And now there's a VPC created. So if I come over here, where'd it go? There it is. To my Terraform and I go to networking I go to VPC and I scroll down to SFO3. We'll see that there is a GSV Labs, um, there is a, GS, a GSV Labs VPC ready for it. So Terraform has created this for us. It is now available. Um, 
the way that you can kind of view Terraform is it's a giant state machine that keeps state of all of your uh, of all of your infrastructure, and then it you know makes the changes accordingly. So now, if we go back to our architecture diagram, let's go ahead and set up our web services. So if we go ahead and go back here, we're going to create a web services file, webservers.tf, web, what do I call it, dash servers.tf. And now we have a brand new file for our web servers. So let's go ahead and create some droplets. We're gonna say resource digital ocean droplet, say web, and then what we're going to do here is we're going to add count. So count is a is an interesting variable. Um, if you go and look at the, at the provider information on DigitalOcean, you actually won't see this. This is a variable that is provided by Terraform and um, most of the resources implemented. And this will basically tell Terraform how many of the different resources to create. So we're, maybe if I want one droplet, maybe I want three, maybe I want 400, who knows? Um, we're going to say image equals var dot image. We're going to have to make a lot of variables here. Image is essentially, do I want Ubuntu? Do I want CentOS? What version of that, et cetera. So the name is going to be, uh, we're just going to call them web for now. Uh, these, this means that all of my droplets will come up with the host name web. I'll come back to this and modify this in a little bit. Um, size, we're going to say var dot droplet size. Again, I could I could be creating all of these as uh, I could just be hard coding all of this data. Uh, it is a, typically a good idea to put them inside of variables. And then we're going to do a quick, uh, which one's the next one? SSH keys. And we're gonna leave that blank for now. We'll come back and fix that in a second. We're gonna say VPC UUID. Um, and this is where this is where the really, the really start of the power of Terraform starts to come across. We created a VPC over here in network and we called it web. And so what I can do here now is I can say digital ocean VPC dot web, referencing it by its name dot ID. So because we created over here and this is all kept inside of a single like state, I can access it. And now I can just say, hey, that VPC I created, go ahead and create it inside of, go ahead and create these droplets inside of it. So I don't have to like find the name or do any of that stuff. I can actually just automatically reference it and I'll know that it's gonna be working properly. And we're going to create this little life cycle, create before destroy. I set this to true. I'll show you what happens when you set this to false. But essentially, the way that Terraform works in an, in an attempt to save uh, as much cloud offering or cloud money as possible is whenever you stand up a server, if you change it, if I change something about this, and if for some reason it has to destroy the server and create a new one, like maybe I want to go from... Uh, Ubuntu to CentOS, uh, that is going to require a recreate on the server. What it will do is it will destroy the old one, then spin up the new one. Now, um, if you're destroying all of your infrastructure before you bring the new one up, that is very likely to lead to an outage because you have nothing running while the new ones are coming up. This life cycle create before destroy essentially reverses that. It will ensure that the new servers are up and running at least to Terraform standards. Like did the, did the Terra API, the Terraform uh, requested return back positively, like, yes, did it work? If it does, then it will destroy them. So this is a very valuable, excuse me, this is a very valuable piece of data here in Terraform because if we don't have this, we could potentially destroy resources before new ones come up. And if you do that and then the old one didn't come up, now you, and the new one didn't come now you have nothing. Everything's down, everything's broken, it didn't work. And that's kind of uh, not good. And then I'm gonna copy and paste a little bit of code real quick uh, from, this and I'll explain this code. I just did not want to have to type this out. So this is what is known as user data. So most of your cloud compute, uh, cloud compute images have a, a tool pre-installed on it called Cloud in it, which is essentially a tool that allows you to like somewhat pre-configure your uh, services so that way they actually will run, work, be ready to go. So like this is going to go ahead and install Nginx. PostgreSQL and PostgreSQL contribute. You probably don't need these if you just need to access the PostQ, uh, Postgres, like using like PSQL to access it, uh, but we'll leave it here for now. And then it runs this command wget dash p var HTML. And basically there's a, uh, there's a web page that I have stored that I want to download. And then I change the name 
to whatever the name is. And basically this way it'll download a web page and put a default web page running for us once we have Nginx running. So this will install Nginx, download a default index.html and have it running inside of our web server. So from there, let's create a couple of these uh, variables real quick. So we need to go back to variables. And just to be a little bit quick on this, we're just gonna copy and paste some of these. So there's the variable image. We're gonna use the uh, Ubuntu 2004. We're gonna go with droplet size. We're gonna use a one VPCPU, one gigabytes. So this is kind of like the standard $5 droplet for DigitalOcean. Um, if we need bigger ones, obviously we can change it or we can set the environment, the variables or the variables file, which we could also use uh, to use to do this differently. And then variable droplet count default equals one. So we're going to default to one and we're going to want more than that. So we're going to change that in a minute. And then one other one that I didn't put in earlier that we'll put in here is we'll go ahead and do name and we're going to call, we'll call this GSV labs. And what we're basically, what we're going to do with this, we're going to come back over here to this network and we're just going to say bar.name. That way I don't have to constantly be typing. If I want to change the name, I can change it to one place. So the image is set, it's taken care of. The size is taken care of. The VPC has already been taken care of. The droplet count has been taken care of. The last thing we need to deal with is our SSH keys. And this is where we need uh, to use uh, Terraform provider data sources. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use this data source. So essentially um, we have that data.tf and this is, data sources are a read-only aspect of getting data out of the API that can that is basically immutable. So I'll be able to read these SSH keys and get the data from them and not actually mess anything up in the process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come back over here to data and we're gonna go ahead and just type that in. We're gonna go data, digital, ocean, SSH key, and we're just gonna call it my main SSH key. And then we're gonna say name equals var dot SSH key. Again, we could, we do, we could do this with variables. Um, don't necessarily have to. You, everybody has their own SSH keys in their account. I need to check and see what mine are called. Uh, security, come on. Okay, so we're gonna go back over here to variables. We're gonna do variable uh, SSH key, that's what I called it, correct? Yes, I did. And then what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna say name equals home desktop WSL. And that's the name of my SSH key. And then we come back over here to our uh, web servers.tf file so we can actually set this up. And then we would say data.digital ocean ssh key dot main dot id and we go ahead and save that and if we go run down here and run a terraform plan ah if you don't spell variable right it doesn't work variable name is not expected here Uh, once again, it does help if you actually save your files. Yep, same thing. Let's go. Ah, come here. Hmm. I'll just copy and paste it, but it looks the same. Oh, that's in variables.tf not in data.tf, variables.tf line 30. Ah, 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 you put the wrong thing there, it doesn't work. Uh, we'll just go with that. We're not gonna have a default SSH key. So now if I actually say uh, Terraform plan, I this is how it would ask me. So if I don't set a default and I don't do anything like that, it will ask me a value. So we're gonna say home desktop WSL. And oh, we forgot region in our droplet. So if we go back to droplet and we just do region equals var dot region. Come back over here, run this again. Uh, 
Okay. Maybe I put that in wrong. Actually, sometimes if I remember correctly, this doesn't play very nicely with, let's come down here and do type equals string default equals. Let me double check that that's actually how I call, spelt it. Quotation marks, paste, save. Hmm, okay, sometimes it does the command line. Maybe there was something about the spaces of the way I was doing that that was wrong. So as you can see now, it's creating uh, one droplet for us. And it has this kind of like little subscript here uh, that says sub zero. And then basically it's gonna create this droplet for us. Now, uh, we're now getting to the point where we want to set multiple variables, but I don't wanna constantly be inputting them in via the command line. I don't always want to be like setting my def my personal SSH key as the default here. If I wanted to give this to other teams, that would not be a very good way of doing it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a terraform.tfvars file here. And what this is, is this is essentially a, a variable file that is automatic. So if I do uh, SSH key equals home desktop WSL, and then we'll say droplet count equal to three. I'm gonna come back over here and remove this default. We're gonna save this and let's do a Terraform plan. Yes. So as we can see now, it actually, it works. So it picked up the variables. Terraform.tfvars is a, uh, it's a variable file that is automatically picked up. So there's that. You can also use, I think, dot auto underscore tfvars as the uh, ending if you want to name it something else. Or you can just do like uh, name something like sfo3.tfvars and then you can specify it via the command line. We're going to use the automatic one just to save us a little bit of time. But as you can see, since I changed the droplet count, now I'm actually getting three different droplets here. So everything is gonna be good with that. And we're actually not going to create this just yet because I wanna continue going forward with the, uh, with the load balancer. And yes, I think I have another 20 minutes. We might not get to the database today. I think the last time that I did it, I didn't get to the database, but there's really not that much special about setting up the database. Um, it's almost as very similar to this. And, and also it's in the sample code that I provided that I will go ahead and send out a TF sample arc. So in the chat, I sent out a short code that you can copy and paste into your, um, into your browser and you'll be able to see all of this code. It's the, not just the code that I get to today. So we have that. Let's go ahead and get, at least try to get through to the load balancer parts. So um, one of the things that we want to be able to do now is we want to be able to create a load balancer. Oh yeah, there's a lot of parts to this. Okay. So because these are all kind of linked together, like you could create separate files for all these. You could create like a, a load balancers file. You can create like a certificates file and all that. Um, the way that I personally do some of these files is or the way that I structure mine is that since the load balancer is only going to be load balancing the, the droplets and it's part of the droplet creation process, um, I'm going to put it in there just in with, uh, with the droplets. I'm not really going to, uh, I'm not going to create any separate files for it. There are many different ways of structuring Terraform uh, files. So I would just say, find the one that works best for you and it'll, it, it'll probably go. For now, we're just going to keep it all in one file. So we're going to do digital, ah, I didn't even say any words, resource digital ocean load balancer. And we're going to say web. And we're just going to kind of do this little uh, web dash dollar uh, var dot region. So this is uh, the Terraform interpolation syntax. So what instead of just naming it like web one, web two, web three, whatever, I'm going to say web and then it's going to be dash SFO3. So that way, whatever the region is, and that way I have a little bit of uniqueness to it. That does remind me that I need to come up here and fix this. Um, so now that we kind of did a little bit of inter ver uh, interpolation syntax, we're going to do var dot name, which we set to GSV labs. And then we're going to do var dot SFO3. And then we're going to do one other one that's a little bit on. So we're going to do count dot index because as you saw, whenever we planned down here, 
that each of these plans has an index. It actually does just create a list of them and creates them. And then we're gonna do count.index. Um, but since that's like zero, one, two, and I like saying like one, two, three in my dashboard, I'm gonna do a plus one here. And then we close that. So this is just a lot of variable interpolation. So it's basically just get web dash name dash s dash, oh, not even SFO3, that's wrong, dash read dot region count. So web GSV labs dash SFO3 dash one dash two dash three. And we go from there. So we take our load balancer. Um, and the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set it up in a region. We're just gonna keep using the same region that we have because we don't wanna put stuff in different regions. It's not, that will not go uh, fun. Then we're gonna do digital ocean droplet dot web dot star dot ID. So because I wanna actually attach these to certain droplets and that it does the traffic through them. I have to specify which droplets. Um, and the, since this is kind of a list of just the way that Terraform syntax works is they just want me to say, hey, do it to all of them. You could specify different ones here if you wanted. This does take a list. So if you wanted to specify them hand by hand, you could. But uh, excuse me, here, we're just going to use the droplet IDs. Uh, VPC UID is basically the same as it was the last time, digitalocean underscore vpc.id. And then what we want to do is uh, this is a personal option of mine, redirect HTTP to HTTPS equals true. Personally, I think that like this, this should be mandated to be on, like everybody should be doing HTTPS. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to create some forwarding rules and I'm going to copy and paste these. Um, we're all, we always want to add the life cycle before true create before destroy. This is something that's, it's odd. Like I get, I get why it's set the other way because you kind of want to worry about cloud costs and stuff spinning up large things. But personally, I, I, this is in every single piece of Terraform that I use is that specific line. And we're going to go and do some forwarding rules. So we're going to say forward the entry port 443 HTTPS target port 80, and then forwarding port 80 to port 80. So we want to forward all of that, but as you can see now here, now it requires a certificate ID. Um, and we want to make sure that we can actually use the certificate ID. So now what we have to do is we have to create a certificate. So what we're gonna do real quick is we're just going to create another resource, digital ocean certificate web. And we're gonna go ahead and say name equals dollar var dot name dash certificate type. Uh, you can provide your own certificate here, but if you use the Let's Encrypt uh, certificate, DigitalOcean will basically create and create, manage, renew all of the magical fun stuff with certificates. Um, domains equals, okay, this is gonna be fun. Uh, <laughs> I haven't even done this yet. Var dot subdomain dot data dot digital ocean domain dot web dot name. We're gonna have to do this in a quick second. And do that. And then of course, once again, our lovely as ever lifecycle create before destroy. So because of this, now that we have a couple more variables here, we need so I'm gonna set a subdomain. So this one's gonna be called we're basically just going to call it the, uh, I think I did it the last time I did it with the region. And then we need another data source. So this will be the last data source that we need. So let's do, the, let's do the data source one first. So the data source, now we need to figure out what domains we have registered to us. So I actually have in my cloud, um, if I can find out where I put that, where to go? Ah, there it is. In my uh, prototype section, I actually have the shark.codes um, domain registered to me. So I'm going to go ahead and use this one. This domain, this using these data sources in this domain only works if you have digital domains registered with DigitalOcean. Um, but it is really nice to have because now I can literally leave everything in, up into including uh, the creation of domain, uh, basically DNS records to, to, to DigitalOcean into Terraform. So we're going to say var dot domain. So we're going to set that to the variable dot domain name. Again, we could set this to whatever we want. I'm going to go back. Uh, it looks like I closed the variables.tf file. And now we're going to add a couple more 
domains. So variable, we're gonna add a couple more here. So variable subdomain, and this is a type equals string, and I'm not gonna set a default on this. Um, actually I could, I wonder if I can do that. We're gonna find out together. I wonder if I can do var.region. Um, variable domain name. That's other one of the weird things is I don't always have to have, you don't, you don't have to have uh, quotation marks around these things. So sometimes you'll see me use it with or without them and it's kind of weird that I haven't picked a way to do it. So we're gonna try doing this. And for some, something tells me that I've tried this before and this doesn't work, but we're gonna find out together. And then we're gonna go back to our terraform.tfrs and for the domain name, I'm gonna set it to shark.codes. So we come back here. And no, I wanted, didn't wanna go there yet. I wanna go back to this. So we come over here to our web servers. So now we have our subdomain set and we have our uh, data source set to actually pull our domain name. So we're good with the web certificates. And let's go ahead and just try to get through the last little piece of this real quick. And yeah, I'm seeing that I'm running out of time. So unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to get to all this today, but we'll get to part of it. We'll at least get the, the uh, we'll at least show you how it stands up infrastructure and get to the load balancing part. Um, and then of course you can always just, uh, ooh. someone said, Ah, thank you for person in chat for sending me that message telling me that it says the wrong thing. Um, so we're at least gonna get to the, getting the load balancer part working. If you, again, if you, I've done this this webinar before, um, so I'll, I'll have, a, I'll, I'll, we can send it out with you uh, to have the uh, another recording of this or you can just look at my uh, current code. So we're going to, sad face, but we're gonna ignore, we're not gonna do the, uh, we're not gonna do the firewall right now. That'll take a little bit of time. So we're gonna go ahead and create a DigitalOcean record. So now we're gonna create a DNS record. And I'm gonna say domain equals data.digitalocean domain.web.name, excuse me. We're gonna make it, it's gonna be an A record, which is your typical IPv4 oh, website record. We're gonna say name equals var.subdomain. We're gonna give it the value. Um, it's gonna to point to our load balancer. So digital ocean load, load balancer dot web dot IP address. And the TTL we're gonna give it, uh, I'm gonna give it a five minute TTL. Um, okay. We just wrote a whole lot of code with no testing and no linting. Let's see what happens. Yep, there we go. Yeah, I can't use variables there. Okay, I remember, I remembered that. Well, we found out together, didn't we? So I do have to give it something and that's, that's, that's not that big of a deal to be honest. We'll just come over here to variables. No, terraform.tfrs and we'll say subdomain equals, uh, geez, collabs. We'll come over here to this terraform plan. Ah, okay, line 52. I didn't type everything out properly. DigitalOcean.vpc.web.id. I, I forgot the variable name. Woohoo. Ah, it's gonna do a lot of stuff. Cool. So it may just work and that's exciting. We are gonna do one other thing because I haven't really talked at all about this outputs.tf file that I, made earlier and we're just gonna kind of um we're just gonna kind of grab a couple so eh, actually that's the only ones i really have oh no i think i can use this okay so basically the outputs.terraform file will allow me to um it, it's going to provide some information for me after the fact and it's really useful because if you're using this in automated setting you may need to like get the, the private IP addresses of these web servers once they're up. 
um, or other things. There's a lot of really valuable things that I'm, I'm not gonna get to go into today too much here. So let's run that Terraform plan again. Okay, I'm gonna turn to Terraform apply and see what happens. Yes. And if you ever become a DevOps or systems engineer, or if you are one already and you've already been using Terraform, you become familiar with the wait, which is essentially you wind up waiting on Terraform. Um, Terraform can only move as fast as the API running it. And sometimes it serializes some of these things. Uh, it paralyzes as much as it can, but if it's uh, very often, like certain things have to come up in certain orders and it knows that. So it will like, as you can see, like the certificate, it's created the certificate at the same time that it created the website uh, or the, 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 uh, the droplets, which is fine. Um, but now like it couldn't create the load balancer before it created the certificate because we have to have the certificate to attach to the load balancer. So that was happening in serial. So now we basically just wait for all of this to go through. Um, whenever I worked at Verbo, Deploying very large Terraform files, like we're talking 10, 20, 30 minutes of Terraform wait was not unheard of when you're deploying an infrastructure with literally tens of thousands of nodes in it and lots of complexities to it. Um, so this really shouldn't take more than five minutes. I'd be surprised if it did. Um, but just know that the more and more complicated your, your infrastructure becomes, the longer it will potentially take for uh, Terraform to run. There is no such thing as running Terraform in a hurry. Um, there's no such thing as running any infrastructure code tools in a hurry. And you shouldn't, you should never do your infrastructure stuff in a hurry. I had a, I had a, a an architect at my last job who told me that these, there are old sysadmins and there are bold sysadmins, but there are no bold old sysadmins. It's because the more, more and more, you know, outages you go through, the more and more stuff you've seen, uh, the less likely you are that you're going to be making rash decisions really quickly. So I'm kind of, there we go. So as you can see, the outputs, it told us what the full uh, FQDN is gonna be. And these are actually the, the web server's IP addresses that are private. They still have public IP addresses. And because we didn't actually get to the firewall today, um, which is fine, it, uh, we they're still accessible. Basically the, the firewall rules would have cut all access to these from the outside world. So, Let's go and check our, where are we at? Okay, so we have our gsvlabs.shark.codes. Let's check this IP address. Uh, looks like it's still setting up the Ah, yeah, it's still doing a little bit of the setup. So the, the cloud init stuff that happens on the back end is not immediate. So it does take a little bit of time. So as you can see, we have our DNS record. If we come over here to our droplets, we have our droplets with their individual names. Um, our load balancers are here. So this is our load balancer. So if I go to gsv.shark.codes, HTTPS. Oh, it's got to do GSV Labs. Hmm. Might still be waiting on the DNS record to prop propagate. Does take sometimes it does take a time. And again, this is just uh, the you know this is typical of network architecture and stuff is that it will take some time for uh, for our DNS records to propagate sometimes. Go back and check my DNS. Hopefully it decides that it wants to be nice to me and it wants to do it quickly. But it could take us a little bit of time, so. And I might've made a mistake too. I, I don't think I did, but anything's possible. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, well, it can, anywhere, if you've ever worked with DNS stuff, sometimes it can take a handful of minutes for DNS to go ahead and go. I've got two minutes left, so if there are any questions or anything, um, would love to hear them. Um, if not, thank you for having me today. I hope that this was valuable, and yeah, we'll go from here. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Mason. That was really great. No, thank, no problem. Love, love, love being here. Um, awesome. So I'm just going to share with everyone um, a couple of reminders. So uh, if you are a Passport member, DigitalOcean is our partner. So you can, if you're an eligible Passport member, you can access up to 25000 worth of DigitalOcean's cloud for 12 months. Um, you can find more details on the DigitalOcean perk page. There's a bit.ly below. Um, and then finally, just wanted to remind everyone of upcoming events. So this Friday, we have um, an Accounting 101 webinar with our partners at Zero. Um, next Tuesday, a social media webinar with our partners at HubSpot. And then Thursday, November 12th, uh, we will be having our pitch night with a fintech um, theme this, this month. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much for everyone. Um, Mason, again, thank you so much for doing this. We'll follow up, um, send all the kind of relevant um, follow-up materials to everyone so they have uh, the link to the recording, et cetera. Awesome, so thank you very much. So if anyone else has any questions, thank you guys very much.